Hi everyone, this is Michael Hoffman at C3. I'm really excited that you've uh, joined our webinar today, uh, The Science Behind Why Online Donors Give. Um, and uh, we're going to get started in one minute. Um, just some uh, early thoughts. We have uh, some terrific material today, and I'm going to introduce um, our main speaker today, uh, Rich Levy from Give Together. And, um, uh, and we have a lot of great material, but there will be some time for questions, so you should be thinking about what it is that uh, your challenges are around online giving and how it relates to our material, and we should have some time for questions. When you have questions, uh, you should uh, put them in the chat or the questions window. Um, you should have a questions window, and you can ask um, your question there, and we will uh, curate and respond to those questions. Uh, Bridget Colling from C3 is on uh, with us today, and she's going to help um, uh, manage the question uh, piece and some of the polls that we're going to have uh, in the presentation today. So uh, with that, we should get started. Uh, we still have some people joining, but we want to make the best use of our, of our hour. Um, so Rich, will you advance, uh, advance the slides? There we go, that's me. Um, so, uh, and, and there's me, and there was Rich, and there's me again. So, um, uh, I'm Michael Hoffman, I'm from C3 Communications, which is where you signed up for the webinar. Uh, I'm really pleased to, to have you today. Here's my contact information, we'll have this also at the end. So if you want to get in touch uh, after the webinar, you absolutely can do that. And I'm very excited to have uh, Rich Levy with us today. Um, Rich is somebody who uh, I've known for many years who uh, works in our space of nonprofit fundraising and has been working on a lot of things that he's going to present today about the science of, of giving. You know, we know and probably all of you have heard talks or read articles about the world of behavioral economics and behavioral psychology and um, and you know people don't always do what they say they're going to do and they don't always do things for the reasons that that they think they're going to do and people like to think of themselves as very rational uh, people though what we know is that the brain has its own ways of functioning uh, and the more that you understand that the more that we know what those things are the better uh, we can be as fundraisers, and so it's not about um, it's not about manipulating people, but it is about giving people the best opportunity to do the right thing. So we are all very comfortable in the work that we do, uh, and we believe we're we're doing things for good, uh, and so we can uh, do things to help our constituents, um, you know, do the most good. So uh, so Rich is going to talk about that. Just as an introduction, if you don't know about um, much about C3, um, and uh, Rich, I think there's a, we can go to the next slide if we can. Oh, um, so actually before we start, we're going to do a, a couple polls, so um, uh, I'm going to let Bridget uh, jump in with the polls. Hi, everyone. All right, so I have a couple polls here. I'm just going to pull them. We have two quick polls at the beginning, and then we'll have one more at the end. Um, so this is just to give us a feel for who's in the room. I'm going to launch the poll now. Um, so we're talking about you know improving. Um, you know we're talking about the science of of online giving. So in which of these areas would you like to see the most improvement this year? Um, I'm seeing a lot of people saying that they're really looking to improve their donations. That makes total sense to me. Um, also seeing a lot of votes coming in for social media engagement, actually, um, which is cool to see. So you've got about 83% of people voting. Get those last few votes in, and then I'm going to close the poll. All right, and I'm going to share the results now so we can see it makes total sense. Overwhelmingly, people really want to improve uh, the donations that they're getting. Um, and surprise, it surprises me to see social media engagement um, at 20% and email list growth at 8%. Um, but that's interesting. I think, you know, I know Rich will be talking a little bit more about um, how you can improve all of these things um, in, in your end of your campaigns. Um, so I'm going to do one more poll right now. I'm going to hide those results. Um, so have you finalized your year-end campaign plans? 
uh, something else we'd like to know, just seeing uh, you know, who's got all their plans in place and are totally ready to go, and uh, who is uh, kind of wondering what are we going to do in the next couple of months. Um, seeing a lot of people with somewhat in place, um, a good percentage of no help. Um, all right, get those last couple of votes in. I'm going to close this poll. All right, I'll share these results now. Um, good to see a pretty even split between the someone in place and no help. So you no help people know that you are in good company. Oh, sorry, we're a dog friendly office. There's a dog in the background. I don't know if you heard. Um, so I'm going to close this poll. I'll turn it back over to uh, Michael, um, and we'll kick off the main content of this webinar. Terrific. Um, so uh, next slide. So uh, other way. Uh, great. So just a little bit about C3. Um, we C3 is a is the digital agency for do-gooders. We work with uh, nonprofits and causes to help people change the world. We uh, uh, do campaigns and strategy as and all digital engagement as well as uh, video. We have a full in-house video production operation here. Uh, we believe video is really a key piece of the digital puzzle these days. Um, and then we also have a very strong web development team, so we build things online, whether that's websites or apps or other things like that. And we work with a wide range, uh, range of organizations uh, in the uh, mostly in the U.S. and uh, both national and local. Our, our headquarters is here in Chicagoland, um, but we also have uh, in Chicago, and we also have uh, folks in Brooklyn, D.C., um, and Seattle. So uh, with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Rich. Rich, thank you so much for being here today and, and being willing to do this. I think that the, there's such a lack of understanding around the science, so I'm going to let Rich talk about what he's going to talk about today, and um, uh, and and uh, we can jump in. Okay, great, uh, and thanks, Michael. Great introduction. Really appreciate this opportunity to share some of these what I consider to be breakthrough insights into the science uh, behind why people give online, and how those insights can actually um, uh, help you exponentially increase your return right from a donor from a donation perspective uh, because it's all about doing better here now um, I want to give you the agenda before we get to our questions first I'm going to talk a little bit about the general scientific insights on giving and this is all good information um, a lot of people forget about how great people feel about giving and how much they want to give and we're going to talk about that and how we can activate that feeling, right? Then we're going to talk a little bit about the status quo, which is how everybody asks for gifts online now. Um, everybody's familiar with the way it works, but there are some really quirky things that we want to point out about the current state of online giving um, and think some corrections that you may want to consider based on this research that, that may be able to dramatically improve your fundraising conversion. We're going to share those startling new insights um, and we're going to focus with a laser-like focus on how to emotionally engage your donors while you're asking them to give, because this is something that does not happen in today's day and age. It's a new technique. It's getting exponential results. Then we're going to talk about uh, taking the online donor and activating their network, right, everybody they're connected with online. <clears throat> then we're going to talk about what I call the candy crushification, uh, or the rewarding of your online donors, right? Uh, in other words, making them feel great and special uh, in unique ways to your organization. Uh, we're going to cover some really cool before and after results, and then we're going to throw it open for questions. Um, so I'm excited about this agenda. I know C3 is interested too. Uh, we're going to get right to it, okay? So if we talk about the general scientific insights that we've learned about giving, there are many, uh, and they're all good, right? So I want to share the basics, not the stuff that we're going to spend a lot of time with on, but sort of the feel-good um, background information that you may or may not know about online giving. Number one, um, Harvard Business School has studied this extensively and what they find out is that it makes you feel really good, right? So that ought to be a positive thing 
uh, for us as fundraisers and actually giving lifts happiness more than spending and, and given the amount of time that people spend spending and giving I think that's a great thing to get grounded on okay so that's number one number two there are a tremendous number of studies say, that say that um, giving actually increases health benefits. And this has been proven in lots of different places, right? It doesn't just make you feel good and be happy. That uh, endorphic release and that reduction of stress has actually proven to fight chronic illnesses like HIV and MS. And this has all been proven um, statistically. Uh, even giving your time, such as elderly volunteers, uh, they are 44% less likely to die over a five-year period when they're involved in giving their time uh, as well as their money. Okay, So another fantastic benefit to giving. Okay, um, There are some tremendous uh, uh, cooperation and connection links here, too. Uh, and when you give more, you're really likely to get back. And your generosity is likely to be rewarded down the line sometimes by the person you give to and sometimes uh, by other people and we're going to have more to talk about that as we get into the presentation with specific techniques. Um, giving also evokes gratitude. Uh, when folks express their gratitude, um, they strengthen their, their um, connections, they boost their own positivity and they boost the positivity of everybody they're connected with as well. And the other thing that's really cool is that giving is contagious. And given the fact that we are now in a social media related world and an online world, and that online is the channel that is growing uh, at a really high rate compared to the other more traditional channels, this is really important. We're going to focus a bunch of time on this about the ripple effect, right? Um, so that when we give, we don't only immediately help the gift recipient, we also spur a ripple effect through our community, and we're going to have some very cool things to share about that. Okay. Yeah, Rich, I'd like to just uh, jump in and just say that you know a lot of times fundraisers. Well, one thing I've noticed is that fundraisers who feel really good about their job of fundraising and and feel like they're helping people by asking people for money do much better in their job. Right? When you when you can go about your day and feel like, hey, I'm helping, um, it's much easier to ask people for money, that you're giving them an opportunity uh, to do good. And I think this science really fits in with that, the idea that there's real benefits to giving. So when you're asking people, when that's part of your job, you're actually opening up these benefits for people. So I just think, you know, sometimes fundraising is a thankless kind of thing. And if we think about it this way, we can be more effective at it. That's really, that's really helpful. And uh, that's part of the general research that we've done that we like to share because it's not just uh, a great thing to do it's something that actually makes everybody feel much better when they're engaged in it and that's a big deal it, it's it, it there's a warm glow effect here that's very powerful and uh, if you're not up for the job and you're not feeling the warm glow <laughs> then you might want to wait so it's important to have that when you're raising funds okay so I want to talk about um, uh, online giving and the status quo, right? Uh, now this is important, okay, because I want to have a level set here as to how people traditionally ask for money online, okay? And this is a, this is a really interesting level set. I'm going to put the sleeping guy away for a second here. Um, what I'm showing you is a traditional online giving form, okay? And everybody's familiar with this, right? You spend a lot of time and energy trying to get people to the boil and to get them emotionally excited and then you land them on a page either through an email or through your website and you put them through a very cold impersonal transactional experience. Now a lot of folks don't know what the average conversion rate is for folks that land on a form like this but it's actually very low and that is very disappointing in my experience and frankly uh, anybody under the age of 45 is going to have the reaction that you have on the left here and, and this particular guy at this age does not have uh, a roll of stamps and a box of envelopes and a checkbook handy so he's either going to be engaged by the online experience or he is not and um, with the vast majority of folks not filling out this form I'm hoping to share some really interesting breakthrough insights to help get beyond that dynamic and you know historically everybody is familiar with direct response and conversion 
and both direct response via direct mail and via, via online, which you're seeing here, excuse me, um, uh, considers that a 1% conversion rate is okay. And um, I'm here to tell you that, that we're sharing some new insights that can radically change this, this uh, percentage. Um, and I think when you think about the difference between what you're doing now, which is what you're looking at here, which is really a hundred year old technique, it's putting a direct mail form up online, versus what I'm going to share with you, I think you'll see some difference. So we're looking forward to sharing that. Now, um, I wanted to have this level set as far as the way that people ask for money now. And then I want to talk about some specific techniques that are really, really powerful in the way that you set up your online uh, giving forms, okay? And the first one is that individual narratives um, typically double response, right? So what I mean by that is um, people are much more responsive, right, to themes and uh, pleas for support that feature a single identifiable beneficiary as opposed to uh, a, a much more general theme, right? So giving to food shortages in Malawi versus helping a young girl named Rokia, uh, who's Malawian, um, has a big difference, okay? We're talking about double the response from the donor, the average donor, for their gift making a difference in the life of a child versus helping a general call to action. And I think this kind of makes sense to everybody on the call, but the thing that we're going to do today before we get to the end of the meeting is show you how to how to put that into action in the way that you ask for the money, okay, um, or the actionable uh, area from an online giving perspective, okay? And Rich, I would say, you know, this is an area where there's a lot of research done, and, and it's very clear that people, um, not only do people respond better to individuals, but any reference often to the scale, a big scale of problems will suppress giving. And I think what that's really about, the way to think about it is that the, your ask has to be proportional to the impact, right? So, and to the issue. So if you tell me that you want me to give $36 for something, but uh, you're telling me about millions of people hungry, that is a complete disconnect between what you just told me to give and the problem you're telling me about, or what I think I can give and the problem you're telling me about. So by making those things aligned, people feel like they can make a difference, and they will. So you know, I think that's really what's behind that, that science that makes a lot of sense. And I agree with that completely, Michael. And what the, just so you know, I mean, an additional piece of that research that I think is really powerful and proves exactly what Michael is saying is that if you add even a second child, right, to the ask or an animal, it radically decreases the amount of the gift. So this is, this is really important stuff that we're focused on here. And to the extent that what you do sticks to this theme, you're going to be more successful. Uh, the other thing that we'll cover are some specific techniques by way of suggestion about uh, letting the donor know how much it costs to feed a child or to save an animal and then they're also much more likely to make a gift in line with what that amount is but we'll cover that in just a few moments okay um, nice thoughts there Michael now from a, a call to action standpoint it's also incredibly important to um, make these as urgent as possible right and what we talk about here, uh, and I'm sure Michael may want to weigh in on this, is you really do need, especially with the fourth quarter coming and there being a deadline here, right, to make your theme compelling, specific, and urgent, right, okay? Um, and you want to have uh, your donation form speak to that, okay? So to the extent that you can actually inject um, uh, urgency, inject uh, what I would call a punch to the gut and inject um, a deadline, you are going to be much more successful, okay? And the um, only thing I would add here, Rich, is uh, something that I find that's incredibly frustrating to me, which is that um, organizations sometimes think that the compelling is the organization and not the, the thing that the organization is trying to do. And so if you're helping puppies or kids or, or homeless or whatever it is you're doing, that's what people care about. 
you're the conduit for them to enable them to do that work. And that's it. So you're really not the hero of the story. And we see that a lot. It's like, help us or help us do this as opposed to do this, right? It's And people don't care about organizations. They don't care about organizational brands. They don't want to support your organization. They want to support the work. And so, you know, I think that relates to this idea of compelling and specific. Uh, it's not about you. It's about the work. That's exactly correct, Michael. So this is where organizations, where we find they struggle too. They struggle presenting giving themes in the most human terms, right? Uh, everybody knows that um, the better job that you do of making the donor feel that their gift is making a real and compelling difference in the life of a child or uh, of an animal, um, the, the more likely you are to be successful as a fundraiser. And that's really what Michael is speaking to here. No one uh, really cares about giving money to your name or your brand. They, they're not interested in keeping the lights on and the building warm. They're interested in making the difference in the life of the child. And that's what we're referring to here. Okay? Now, I want to show you something that I think is pretty darn cool. Okay? I'm going to talk about emotionally engaging your donors. And I think this is a big, big deal. Now, when Michael was talking about um, don uh, donors not caring about you and caring about your product, which is planting a tree, or feeding a child or saving an animal like you see here. Um, what I want you to think about in the donation experience is telling a story to the donor about the great that their gift would do. Now, I'm going to step through this for you in just a moment. And here you'll see a donation experience that shows the donor planting a tree, okay, in steps. Or it shows the donor feeding a child, or it shows the donor freeing a dog. Okay, Now, I want to take a moment to actually show you this in real time, because I think this is pretty amazing. Okay, So uh, I do want to show you how this technique has been embedded uh, in the kinds of approaches uh, that folks are getting better results from. So what you're looking at here is, a, is the actual technique being embedded in the donation form, and instead of filling in those 20 or 30 or 40 fields of information and having a 10 or a 15 percent completion rate, um, what nonprofits are experimenting with is having the donor move their mouse over a transformational image, right, and click on the amount they want to donate. Now, the eye moves from the top left to the bottom right. Watch what happens here. This is a Feed the Hungry campaign, and the, what that's happening is the donor is seeing their great work or if they would give a gift, right? So in this case, we're feeding the hungry, and the donor is being emotionally engaged. Now, what's different about this experience versus a fill-in-the-blank form? Okay, well, in a fill-in-the-blank form, you've got five or ten or twenty fields of information, no donor engagement. Here, you're showing the donor the great work their gift would do. You're engaging them, and you're locking them in with one click. Now, this set of techniques alone has been used in 1,200 campaigns so far, and on average, it has tripled the donor conversion rate. So um, I wanted to show you exactly what we're talking about theoretically in real and practical terms here. Okay. All right. Let's go back to the presentation, and uh, let me just bring it up again for you. So again, what kinds of themes work well here? Well, grayscale going to color, uh, empty going to full. Uh, sad going to happy, before going to after, you get the idea. And this visual metaphor resonates incredibly well with the theme that we talked about before, which is the individual narrative, right? Help my dollar, um, help my gift plant a tree, help my gift feed a child, help my gift save a sick dog or a sick cat. And again, this is what the donor is interested in. They're less interested in you, uh, and they're more interested in the product that you offer and having you make this feel real and engaging to them. Okay? All right, so this is the first technique in action. Okay? Um, and by the way, that's across 1,200 campaigns, on average, triple the number of people who give, which is pretty amazing. Okay? All right. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about is network 
activation, right? So if we're talking about the online channel, and this is a big, big deal, right? Uh, and we're talking about the online channel today and the online channel as the growth channel, which, is, which I think is, is the point of the meeting today. We're going to share with you ways that you can activate the networks of the folks that are on your list now, okay? And this speaks to <clears throat> the email list growth that we talked about. Now, it's interesting to me that only 8% of you guys are interested in growing the email list and 72% are interested in, in donation growth. We just covered the donation growth um, with an interesting technique that's tripling donor conversion. What I want to do is talk about how to activate your network, right, or your email list to get them to be ambassadors for your organization. And what I want to do is I want to show you something in real time that I think is fascinating, okay? So you have an opportunity that, that nobody takes advantage of, and it is a really big opportunity. Uh, and the opportunity presents itself every time that somebody donates to your organization online. So uh, I just gave a gift to organization XYZ here, okay? And obviously all of you are going to thank me for, for giving online. But there is a tremendous opportunity because I am now in the, in the warm glow of having made the donation. I am feeling great about myself, as Michael said, right? And I, wanna want, I want to show you something here that's spectacular. If you can capture this moment and see which of your donors want to see what their impact would be, okay? you can take advantage of this opportunity, and it's a massive opportunity. So let's say I just gave $50 um, to the SPCA, and I get thanked here, okay? But I also am made aware of the opportunity that if I take a couple of seconds, I can have an exponentially larger impact on the organization. Watch what happens if I move the slider and see what my impact would be if I invite some friends to the campaign. You'll see the predicted impact up on the upper right-hand corner and this is amazing. I just gave $50, but I'm actually being shown that if I invite my friends uh, and my network, I can add another $1,400 to the total. And I'm going to give you the math here. This is a new technique. Um, it's only been used in these 1,200 campaigns that we referenced. But on average, 6% of the donors are ambassadors in waiting. So 6% of your list actually wants to do this and can't do it now. They average $2,100 raised each, and 76% of those folks are brand new. And that kind of makes sense because Rich is on your list, but his Pinterest scrapbookers and his LinkedIn connections and his Facebook friends are not. Now, if I'm one of those six percenters, this is what I do. I click on the invite button, and <clears throat> bear with me a second here. <clears throat> I click on the invite button, and um, what happens is, the email comes up that you create and it gets personalized to my list, right? And it doesn't matter where my list is. It could be on my Mac or on Gmail or Outlook. And I can also connect instantly to everybody that I'm connected with socially. So if we go back, and we're going to cover a case study in just a moment, uh, if we go back, this is how the growth comes about. And this is the email list growth standpoint. This is the donor acquisition uh, piece of being socially connected online, okay? And I think this is very important, and I, I find it fascinating that we only got an 8% bite on that portion of the apple. So uh, I think it's important that we share this uh, and that you guys are aware of this from a technique perspective. Okay, cool. Um, now, I want to show you something else that I think is important, uh, and I know that um, Michael may want to speak to this as well because He's involved in this piece of the business uh, in a different way than I am. But um, I want to talk for a few, a couple of minutes about Facebook uh, because of just how huge uh, the network is and how many people are connected via Facebook to the folks that you're connected with online, i.e. your email list, right? So you may be a nonprofit that has uh, 5,000 or 25,000 or 250,000 Facebook fans, but you've had a tremendous challenge to do anything other than to get them to like you, right? And it's, it's wonderful that they like you, um, but they really should figure out how to support you as well. And what we have found, <clears throat> um, just based on the technologies that we've worked with, 
is that if you integrate, do a good job of integrating a Facebook application, in other words, if you allow your campaign to live and to breathe and to update in Facebook without having to be tied to your website and without having to force your constituents to uh, go through your website to support you, in other words, they can just spend their time in Facebook and they can interact with you and your campaign and they can invite people to the campaign and they can see the campaign update in Facebook. We're actually seeing 8.5% of the traffic from Facebook donating. Not liking, but donating. And this is, this is strong. This is across 1,200 campaigns that we've seen this. And I haven't seen too many other statistically proven areas where you've gotten such strong results from Facebook and I wanted you to think about this, right, from a from a, a going forward uh, perspective. So, so that's really interesting, and um, it's kind of news. Yeah, I, would, I would just add, I think, you know, there there has been traditionally this idea that we have to bring people back to our home base, our website, or we've already invested in a set of tools, for example, that run our donation pages, and we don't want to do anything you know outside of that and that was really um, I would say state-of-the-art three or four years ago I think there's much more sense that you have to get people where they live um, and where they feel comfortable and so we've seen different technologies figure out how to make this kind of seamless integration uh, with Facebook um, and and organizations become more comfortable with the idea that hey for this campaign I can actually have this thing live over here and we can import the data when we need to, and we don't have to worry that much about it uh, in the way that you know we used to. That these things can be um, add-ons, and and it, because what you care about, your internal compartments and categories, and your rules and your hopes around your own data, nobody outside your organization cares about any of that, right? For the user, for the donor, it's all about their experience. And when you put that donor experience first and up front you make different choices than when you put your IT people up front or, or whatever. So I think that's, that's a key here is just being do donor centric and saying, you know, what experience would be best for that person that we're talking to on Facebook. That's great. And, and as Michael has said, these, these techniques uh, used to be sort of one size fits all. You need to get everything in one place. Uh, now they're just add-ons, right? So you can plug these into whatever you're currently doing and test some really cool stuff for year-end if you'd like. So uh, much lighter lift, uh, much more interesting results, and frankly, uh, from the donor's perspective, as Michael says, uh, much more donor-centric. And we're going to get into the donor centricity piece of this uh, in just a little bit here. Okay. Uh, now, uh, from a donor-centric standpoint, <laughs> uh, great segue, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we could have practiced enough to make that work this well. Um, but uh, here's the thing, okay? Your donors really want to feel like they're special. And everybody knows this, but everybody struggles with how to make them feel that, right? And I want to show you something that I think is really compelling. And I'm calling it real-time rewards, but um, in the introduction, I called it the candy crushification or the gamification of fundraising online. And here's the deal, okay? If I'm a fundraiser, okay, and I'm Kate, and I'll show you what Kate looks like here in just a second, okay, <clears throat> you'll actually see Kate's picture on the left-hand side of the screen here. Could have just as easily been a video that she dropped on here from her iPhone or from, from her iPad. And you'll see that Kate wanted to raise $4,000 uh, for this organization. And by the way, this organization has 6,000 email addresses and they almost reached their stretch goal uh, for Valentine's Day of $120,000 online, which is a heck of a reach for that size list. Um, but she raised $5,337. That's not the part I want to clue you into here. I want to show you the badges that she's earned, okay? So if we look under her picture and you see the four badges that are there, I'm going to take my mouse and I'm going to put them over each one of them so you can read this. And what's happening in real time, and I find this fascinating, is Kate is getting rewarded for setting up her personal page or dropping a video on here because that will triple the, the response rates that you'll get from a fundraising perspective. And then when she reaches a threshold of uh, getting enough number of, of people to visit her fundraising page, she gets badged for that 
If we go down the conversion funnel, the next thing she'll collect uh, is a badge for when she actually gets folks to donate after she visits her page. And voila, uh, she's getting a super duper badge for reaching the $5,000 level. Now, this has typically not been done before. Uh, this is a really new technique. Uh, and to the extent that we've been able to test the data on this from a before and after perspective, this has ratcheted up the fundraising results an extra 51%. So I don't know if you've seen this, Michael, uh, before, um, but this is a new technique that we wanted to share as part of the session today because I think this is the future of online engagement. So I wanted yeah, to I, I think, you know, Rich, this is really interesting because I think that many of us have known that you know, things like badges work and, and have known that a lot of these things work in theory and the challenge has always been, you know, integrating these things and how complicated it is to do it yourself and I think that's, I think just the, the fact that the tools are getting uh, easier, uh, uh, less, uh, less expensive to deploy, the idea that you mentioned about um, being add-ons and being able to use add-ons in a way that you couldn't before. So I think all these techniques that you know we we've known about for years about sort of gamifying things and these things, but really had no good way to implement it. Being able to do that is is the big innovation for me. You know that that hey, this isn't rocket science anymore for you. It's somebody else's rocket science that was already already figured out. Exactly. So, so, we're, so what I'm trying to share with the group that we have on the line today is that this is no longer custom software, right? right? It literally took five minutes to set these rules in place uh, for this customer, for this nonprofit, in their back office, and bam, these badges happen automatically. Uh, and what they're doing is they're rewarding the behaviors that are designed to raise the most money uh, for the fundraiser and obviously for the nonprofit. So this is a cool breakthrough, and I thought it was important to spend a few moments just sharing with folks how these things are actually being applied in the real world. Okay, Now, <clears throat> uh, I want to talk about, and this was a great segue, Michael, I want to talk about sort of the donor centricity piece. Uh, if we go from real-time rewarding, right, uh, and we can move along to empowering the donor, and what I mean by that is, you know, now that your donors are connected online, and hopefully some of you are using some tools uh, that will allow them to reach out to their uh, Facebook friends, their LinkedIn connections, their Pinterest scrapbookers, you know, their Twitter followers. Um, and for the folks that are passionate, those six percenters that we talked about before, these are your ambassadors in waiting. These six percent of your list actually really want to do this badly, and they may not have the tools that they need to do it as easily and as powerfully as they would like. Um, and if you give them those tools, I want to show you the way that you can empower each of those people. So here we're looking at the folks who donate to an online campaign. And if we look at Rona, donor number one, she gave $525. Um, there was a matching gift program in play for this campaign at the front end of the campaign. So in other words, somebody said, hey, instead of me just giving $5,000 to the campaign, I'm going to purpose that as a matching gift and everybody that gives within that $5,000 window, um, I'll add my the same amount of money to their, to their pool. So Rona gives $525. It's instantly matched by $525. Rona hit the invite button and she passed this to her Facebook friends and her email list and her Pinterest scrapbookers. They kicked in another $2,150. So you're empowering Rona by showing her in real time that she was actually instrumental in bringing in $3,200, even though only 525 was her direct contribution. So these are the ways that you can make the donor feel special, right? And let's go over them again. You can um, allow to, me you can measure everything that they're doing and bring it in in one window, which is really exciting. You can update the thermometer in real time with the match and with the network gifts, and you can badge them and make them feel super special. Uh, and if I was a fundraiser, <laughs> I would want to treat this person as a $3,200 contributor instead of a $525 contributor. And that's a really cool thing from an impact and an empowerment standpoint. Okay, So just some interesting uh, ways for you to look at how you're uh, possibly interacting with your donors, the way that you can pull it all together, 
uh, and how we're going to be talking about engaging the next generation of online supporters because let's face it they're not just under ten thousand dollar givers online they are your next generation of major donors as well so for the folks that are 30 and 40 and 45 now this is the way that they're going to choose to interact with you and the better job you do of doing that the more successful they are going to become uh, they're, they're going to become major donors 10 or 15 or 20 years from now okay uh, now, from an impact standpoint, the other thing I want to share with you is how you can actually project impact, right? Um, not just based on how much people uh, raise, but on how successful your campaign has been from a human perspective. And let's take this back to what we were talking about before, right? Where the more successfully with the donor you are of making them feel like their gift is lining up with saving an animal or planting a tree or in this case feeding a family right the more likely they are to give now to use Michael's take uh, you know if it costs sixty dollars to feed a family here uh, this organization chose not to show how many dollars they raised but they divided the total amount of money raised by sixty and they're showing how many families the campaign fed so the campaign is feeding eight thousand three hundred and thirty three families this puts this in a human scale and each of the fundraisers right and you're seeing an individual family who was a fundraiser on the right each of them gets credited with their portion of the eight thousand three hundred and thirty three families fed so in this case this family's activity the gift they gave um, or the gifts they gave the people that they passed the campaign to that also gave that total amount fed sixty families out of the 8,333 and this can easily be done now uh, it hasn't been done often but it is now available to be easily done and this is the kind of human impact and human scale that people get excited about okay so I wanted to share that with the, the group as well because um, very few people have seen this and some of these things are actually really really new from a from a, a capability standpoint okay <clears throat> Now, the last thing I wanted to kind of end with before we have a few moments to go through one last poll and ask some questions of the, of the group is I wanted to give you an A-B test uh, for this specific set of techniques <coughs> and sort of what happened before and after. So let me give you the metrics for this because I know we have folks here that are all over the board from a size standpoint. So this particular nonprofit has 18,000 email addresses on their list and every year at the end of the year they do an e-appeal in December electronic appeal they send out one email each week and then they do a last push the last day of the year probably sounds very familiar and with a fill-in-the-blank kind of approach the traditional approach they were never able to raise and that's I'm talking about a fill-in-the-blank donor form right they were never able to raise more than three thousand seven hundred dollars they tried the new technique that I showed you which was the emotional engagement uh, the one-click donation um, and the social sharing and I'm excited about the revenue growth that they had in 12 13 and 14 but I'm even more excited about the number of visitors to the campaign the number of donors and the number of new donors and that gets into the email list growth that we talked about uh, that we only had the 8% on so I wanted to kind of focus in on this as another piece of the puzzle uh, that's potentially challenging uh, and some of the techniques that we're sharing today may be really beneficial for so um, I do want to uh, throw it open Michael um, to you now um, to handle kind of any of the questions that may have come up during the presentation and to make sure that we handle those as well Rich thanks so much I think this has been just uh, tremendously interesting and I think that regardless of um, uh, what platform you're using, I think asking these questions, how are you emotionally engaging your donors um, at key moments uh, in the donation process, how are you encouraging them to share, you know, in, in what ways, and are you showing them the impact of this? These are all questions we should be asking, really, of all of our campaigns. Um, and so you didn't say it, Rich, but I'll say it, all of these techniques and everything that you showed is what you guys have been building at, at Give Together, and so I think that there are a lot of platforms that handle basic donation functionality, but I'm, I'm, I love that you guys are really focused on 
pulling these science-based techniques in there, whether it's badges or the emotionally powerful donation forms, uh, and then also figuring out how you can play as an add-on, how you can you know, make it easy for people to use your platform but not abandon their existing you know, websites, platforms, other things. So I think that's really terrific. So I, I want to, if anybody has questions specifically um, about any of these techniques, about uh, any of the data, about uh, the platform, uh, any, any of it, um, you should uh, put your question uh, into the questions um, uh, tool there in your um, give together in your give together in your go to webinar side there. Um, so Bridget, do we have any questions here? I don't, yeah. I don't see any. And we we do have a few. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, hear you great. 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 Um, so Tiffany Meyer asked, she's curious how this framework translates to asks to corporations and businesses versus individual donors, which I think is a question that a lot of other attendees might have as well. So I wonder how you and Rich would respond to that. Uh, do you want me to take the first stab at that, Michael? Sure, go ahead. Okay. So traditionally, the, what we're talking about here is the kind of approach that we would be made from the nonprofit to their individual donor or prospective donor, right? So these techniques are really just, hopefully, more efficient ways to make that kind of ask. Um, uh, you know, it's less suited to sort of a corporate or a major gift uh, kind of approach. Um, we've seen this particularly successful with the under $10,000 and below gift levels for individual gifts online. Yeah, and I would just say in terms of like major giving, you know, I think this is what good major gifts people do in person is to really connect what that major giver can do with what the impact of that gift would be. So being able to say, you know, you are a person who can give at this level and here's what would happen. Here's, here's why, here's what that money can do. Um, and, you know, so the good major gifts officers are the ones who can, you know, uh, make that real and very personal for that person. And I think what's neat about this platform is the idea that it sort of brings that idea of, of impact directly to your money to a mass audience. So the idea is, hey, we can actually take that small email list and grow because not only are we activating those donors, but we're actually activating them as people who can share. So we're able to take our, you know, over several years, and I think that case study that you showed over four years is a great example, you know, showing, you know, how you can grow um, uh, over time because, you know, a big piece of this is the sharing. So once you start to get people sharing, you then have new donors who then become sharing and it's the, really this network effect. So, um, you know, I think this is just a very powerful set, as Rich said, really for the individual givers. And now we have seen a couple of other scenarios that, that would be also interesting to mention. One is that we have seen selected individuals who, in my opinion, fit the profile of a major donor, actually raise six figures uh, through the networking piece that we showed you, right? So uh, they would set a goal of $100,000, broadcast the campaign to everybody they're connected with, and some of that money would come in in checks in major donor fashion, but it would all be added into the total, and we've seen folks raise six figures using the online connection tools that we shared with you. The other, the other solution uh, that, hold on just one second, the other solution that we've seen is that this has worked well for the public phase of a capital campaign. So um, if you wanted to weigh in there, Michael, on either one of those, let me know. Uh, but those were the yeah, two I'd other... Like to, I know we have some more questions, and we, we have about 10 minutes, so I'd love to uh, get to the next... Okay. Next question, if we can. Um, sure. Um, Ayana asks, how do you suggest that uh, nonprofits collect um, necessary donor info, like email, phone number, et cetera, but avoid using those treacherous long forms that we see on so many nonprofit websites? Sure. What a great question. So here's the deal, okay? Everybody does this backwards right now. So everybody asks for all those fields of information first, 
and <laughs> the vast majority of people don't finish. What we're suggesting is that you engage them like this and lock in their giving level with one click, and after they're committed, then you click the donate button, and then you collect the information, and you do it in that order. So uh, hopefully that answers Ayana's question. Great. We have a, uh, another question here from Joe White, who asks, how would you humanize more abstract, a more abstract fundraising appeal, um, like helping fund campaigns around climate change? Uh, which I know is something that we've heard from some of our clients before. You know, how do you bring those big ideas home and show how they affect people on a personal level? Sure. So that's that's another great question, and I would consider a visual metaphor, right? So uh, what I would mean by that is I would consider dropping in a picture here that showed um, an area that was lush and green, uh, or an area that was covered with ice, uh, and then the same area morphing into uh, the area with with the snow all melted, or in California's case, frankly, uh, the area of drought. And uh, that is a tremendously powerful visual metaphor to bring home that kind of a situation. Mm, I think that's a great answer. I mean, we often try to find, you know, those smaller uh, things that that the funds can do. I think it is a cha it is a different challenge when you have um, when you have uh, advocacy-based organizations, you know, and thinking about, you know, what is what is the, what do the dollars mean to mobilization? Uh, and but but again, it goes back to that human scale, which is what realistically can this fifty-dollar donation do or a hundred-dollar donation do? Um, and how do we come up with those human scales? So I think having a kind of brainstorming inside your organizations is a good way to do that is to really think, you know, what are the different things we can talk about? Yeah, and one other thing there, Michael, we think it's very important to tell the donor what an average giving amount actually will do, right? So here we'll see, consider that $180 feeds a child for the rest of the year, and then that becomes the suggested donation level. So what does that chunk of money accomplish from a public policy standpoint? That is the the brainstorm discussion that you want to have. So I, right, and it's just a little harder when you know the outcome of advocacy, for example, is not known. You know to guarantee those outcomes. So it's a it's definitely a more nuanced and complex uh, thing when you're not doing direct services. Correct. Uh, so Bridget, do we have? I think we have time for for maybe for a couple more questions. Yeah, we have a question from Karen that I think kind of piggybacks off um, this previous question. Um, she asked, does this research also track donors by their socioeconomic status, and how does this percentage of giving change by annual house, household income? And she also asks, how do the statistics change if the campaign is not about hunger, children, or pets? Ah, okay. All right. Well, there is a limit to the refinement of the analysis that we've been able to do, right? So um, what we can tell you at a macro level is that across 1,200 campaigns, and those campaigns are across all different portions and kinds of nonprofits, social services, arts, uh, uh, you know, health, etc. Uh, on average, we have tripled uh, the percentage of folks who give with that kind of experience. The data has not been boiled down uh, much further than that from an analytics standpoint. Uh, it's too new. Okay, so I don't have that that uh, granular analysis for the ASCO, okay? Um, to answer the second portion of the question, uh, the real strategic exercise is, is taking the organization's mission, right, and trying to humanize it as much as possible. Um, and that is the strategic discussion uh, that C3 or ourselves or whoever you work on this with should be having with you or you should be having internally uh, in order to make the, the product that you represent um, feel as compelling as possible to the donor. Yeah, and I think you know we've seen this for years. We've had this discussion with with uh, nonprofits around. You know, if we only had puppies, we would we would be great. You know, our fundraising would be easy. Um, and I think it is what Rich said there about turning it into human scale. And so we've done things where, um, for example, an organization that does legal aid or legal services. Well, the legal services themselves are not interesting in terms of uh, those kind of compelling emotional things. What's interesting is the family that needs the legal services because of an eviction or some 
thing that's going on with them. So telling that story and sort of getting to the root of, of what it's all about is, is really often the key um, and not necessarily the actual uh, activity, right? So it's like going through the organization's activity to why it's why you're doing it in the first place and trying to to put some uh, sort of flesh on that story uh, there, and that that has impact. And you know we've had lot you know we've had lots of experience with uh, clients where we've made videos or we've done campaigns or other things you know over over you know the last years you know where we're where that's part of the process is really discovering what or what, what would they be comfortable in, in talking about and how do we how do we thread that needle so I think we have time for maybe one last question yeah there's so there's uh, one last question that asks what do these features look like on a mobile phone and I want to ex I'd, I'd love rich for you to respond to that question but then I'd also like to expand it and have both of you share um, you know, what advice that you would want to give to nonprofits as they're going into giving season? Um, how can they make, um, you know, thinking mobile first a real central idea to their campaigns? And how can they really put mobile first thinking into action for their organizations? Okay, great. So uh, the good news is, is that these techniques that we've shared with you, in other words, this kind of morphing and emotional engagement has actually gotten to a point where it's really mobile friendly. So that's exciting, okay? So it doesn't matter whether you're on an iPad or, um, uh, you know, uh, an Android or an iPhone uh, or, or a computer. Uh, you still have the same incredible new age experience with a 3x uh, a response rate, okay? Um, I'm going to leave, uh, leave it up to Michael, I think, uh, to wrap up the sort of mobile portion um, because that's a big deal. As Michael knows, uh, more people are, are uh, interacting with content now on mobile than they are on laptop, and um, I'll throw it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Rich. I think, you know, this, uh, we're seeing just incredible numbers around mobile engagement. You know, we have clients that are showing us that, you know, 70% of emails are being opened on mobile first and, you know, those kind of statistics, and it's just been exponential in its growth. It's really um, grown just dramatically. So when we talk about mobile first, we really think, uh, you know, the, one of the problems, one of the big problems is in an, inside an organization, you start to plan your campaign, and what do you do? You sit around the computer screen, a big computer screen, and you start looking at, at, at things uh, together. And so one of the things that you should be doing is starting from your phone. When somebody says, something on our website's not right, you should be looking at your phone first. You should be looking at those things first uh, in, a, in a mobile context and making that part of your own process. So that's the, the first thing that, that I would say about that. But also just is that recognition that that's where people are going. And so when you're designing things, when you're creating things, you know, using that phone as your first place to go and check it out um, will have, a, will have I think, the biggest single difference to what those results are. And if you, if you haven't made your website mobile responsive, that is an absolute must do. Google is, is punishing websites that aren't mobile responsive, so um, there's lots of reason to do it. Um, and the second thing I would do is your email templates, making sure that they're mobile optimized. So those are like the very top things. And then it's great if you can use an out-of-the-box tool like Give Together, like we just saw, and it's mobile, it's built for mobile responsive, it's built for Facebook integration. And then you don't have to worry about it because the platform, you know, is worrying about with you. So, um, so we're at the end of our time. Um, I just want to thank Rich. Thank you again, really, for doing this. It's so interesting, the, the science, and I love doing things that have a basis in research and in science. Um, there's my contact information here on the screen, Rich's contact information here on the screen. Please feel free to reach out to us. We will send a follow-up email, I think, to the attendees around uh, where they can find this content uh, and to reach us as well. Um, and again, Rich, thanks so much for, for being part of it. You're welcome. Okay, everybody have a great day. <laughs>